Good girl, then. Now, go ahead, Matthew. All right, good. Well, good day, everybody. Um, this is our fourth presentation, as you know, and um, when I was putting this one together and I had these topics in front of us and I was trying to think how do they all interrelate and they do. And so one of my goals today is to, to show you how all these pieces fit together. So part of this is a review. Uh, uh, we, we talked about table mapping on the third lesson. And then we also have talked briefly about friendly names and languages. And then I'm hoping by going over some things this morning, it will become even more clear. Uh, I hope it'll become clear. And then um, the main topic, as it was kind of announced, was the import wizard. And we'll certainly cover that. Uh, but in order to do that, I'm going to use an example, codes and code groups. And then if time allows, I'm not sure if we're going to have enough time to do all this, but if it does, I incorporated searches into this lesson as well. So let's uh, rock and roll. So, um, it's kind of hard to take questions live here. So if anybody has a specific question and they think they could ask it, uh, we either by chat or um, verbally, I'll take a minute or two for questions. Any? We're getting all our greetings. And just as a reminder with questions, uh, and several of you have taken advantage of this, um, send me an email. And what I'm going to do, I have to do this between now and next Thursday, I guess, or at least Friday, um, is aggregate all those questions and put a question and answer page. And we'll have that available too with the screens, with all the other stuff. Okay. so. Typically, when you use stuff is when the questions pop in. So we'll we'll just continue. So uh, Juan Carlos and I were having a side conversation the other night, and he we were talking about the data view editor and when people actually use it, and he came up with a really good example. Um, when when you're on the global project page, there's a link to uh, GitLab source files. By the way, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to completely revamp this menu and I'm going to hope to make things a little bit easier to find. But anyway, one of the choices there is GitLab and GitLab is where we have a lot of source files. We also have the wizards and uh, a lot of these were created by my friend who said good morning from Peru, Edwin. Um, but some of these are others that were funded by the crop trust. And one of them I have circled here is the Genesis uh, wizard. And when you go to the GitLab page and you start to get the materials you need, the files for Genesis, the Genesis wizard, there's a note and it says, don't forget to import the data view, get passport data. And that's how you get that data view into Green Global. The only way you can do it is through the, uh, data view editor uh, through the admin tool, and you have to bring in that one data view. Without that data view, the, the Genesis wizard won't work properly. So just a good example. And um, I have a question, and you could write a quick answer in chat. I'll wait 10 seconds or so. When must you do table mappings? <clears throat> this should be a very easy answer. Remember the chat has that little balloon type icon. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, that is great. When we modify the table, absolutely. And when we modify, when we add or subtract, whatever you do to the database. So you must, very good, Janice. Um, uh, we must map whenever there's a schema change and whenever there's a change either with the fields and or the tables. And we do that because that's how we coordinate the database with Green Global. And if you think about it, that makes sense because the database is just out there and we have to tell Green Global that there have been some changes and table ma mapping is what does that. And we saw this slide the other day. Basically, it's taking the table fields and mapping them to data view names. And I want to talk about this a little bit more this morning because this concept of friendly names is a little confusing. Um, but I also, before I get to this and, and come back to this, I have some new material here that I didn't have time for the other day. I didn't think we would, so I saved it for this time regarding table mapping. And if you recall last week, my, um, or last session was I showed you how by adding a new field, I could include that in data views. And I went through that whole process. Now, I'm not gonna go through all of this today uh, per se, but I wanna walk through a couple slides uh, regarding what you have to do to put in a new table. And it's very interesting. Yesterday, uh, I had a support question from somebody in uh, a country in Europe who is trying to do things with their Green Global database, and they were trying to add a new table. And he didn't quite get it correctly. And so uh, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm anxious to see. I sent him these guidelines. But it's there's a couple things. and. I need to update the admin tool guide because I realize this data, this information is not in the guide, I don't think. I'll have to look, but I don't think it is. Um, whenever you make a new table, there are certain specifications. The first field must be an integer primary key, the name of the table, underscore ID. And you know that all of our tables have that naming convention. The second thing that's really important is in order for the middle tier to work with the table, it must have those six standard fields created by date, modified by date, owned by date. And we talk about them as being the overhead. In other words, you must have those. If you create a table with one or two fields, it's not gonna work unless you also include these six fields. And I, I should emphasize, I think I have that on the next slide. Yeah. So use an existing table. Why start from scratch? There's about 150 good tables already in the database. So if you're a database person that knows SQL Server, it should be fairly easy for you, and there's multiple ways to do this, to create the table and uh, or duplicate the table and then strip it apart and, and just keep the things you want and add fields that you need. And that way you've already got those audit fields and you could rename the ID field to the appropriate name. Another thing, and again, I don't think this is in any of the other documentation. I and mean, we just, this was mentioned to me just this week. Um, ah, there's a very good message of, <laughs> I'll come back to that. Let me finish my thought here. Data fields, I'm sorry, date fields must be declared date time too. That's all I'm gonna say. Anybody that's a, a database person knows. Um, yeah, uh, Juan Carlos flashed a, a reminder. Don't put a bunch of new tables in the Green Global. It really is not probably necessary. Um, and we said that the other day about fields. Literally, Simon has five extra fields that the USDA does not have. And if you go to each gene bank, you'll probably find something similar. There might be one or two fields that they've added, but not, you know, carte blanche, a whole bunch of fields. So um, I'm not gonna go through this line by line, but I gave you some sample script here. So for this first step, it says use uh, SQL Server Management Studio to create a script from an existing table 
and then the directions here tell you what to do, and then finally map this table in the ad in the admin tool. So you know that's the normal steps. You first create the database table, and then you have to map it. So the directions on this page tell you to alter the table name, replace the fields in the middle, and leave the final six that are in yellow. So these are the names you're going to change. Then any of these fields in the middle that aren't highlighted, you make appropriate to your needs. And then the yellow fields must stay. So I'm not going to dwell on this. It's here. You can cut and paste and play with this. But again, and, and one Carlos is absolutely right, don't make extra tables just for the heck of it. Um, it's a big deal. So do it with caution. And um, we had talked about this the other day. When you map a field, um, we have steps, and, I, and we talked about these steps. I primarily want to get to the step five, and you'll see why, uh, to continue with today's discussion. So whenever we have a new field, we use it um, SM, SSMS, and then we start the mapping process, and we go through these steps. We right click on the table name. We do this remap from the schema. And again, this is all a review from the other day. And then we get to this screen. We have to generate the default mappings. In this case, the only one that changed was accession. I didn't do show all tables. If I wanted to, I could do the whole Shamil, but I, I'm not. I'm just doing accession. And then finally, the reason I wanted these slides was to get to this slide. So um, and this is the point I'm trying to clarify today, this idea about the friendly names, okay? When you map a field to, to a data view, in this screen, the table mapping field detail screen, the title is the friendly name. In other words, that's the name that appears as the heading in the curator tool by default whenever this database field is used. So in my example the other day I created a field and I gave it the title URL. So anytime I were to use that same database field, the default heading name would all would be URL because I gave it that title here. And again you do this in table mapping and Obviously, you can do it in the different languages. If your system was using multiple languages, then you would have to do that for each one. I'm also today going to talk about the language called ENG. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this, but it's a pretty handy trick that is very useful. So I'm going to go through that today. So probably what I would have done here in reality is for ENG, put the same title. URL, and I would have put the same description. But in, for instance, in the US, we're not using uh, Czech or Spanish or French or Portuguese. So I would fill out, in, in my case here in the USDA, these two. And I'll come back to ing in a little bit. So for example, you all know that accession prefix is the common heading name that choose whenever you use the field accession number part one when you're in the curator tool. Okay, that's just the way it is. Okay, but you can override that. If you ever had a reference to, um, let's go back to this field, and it was in a different data view, but it was still using this field, you could actually change that heading. And I'll illustrate that again here. So in that case, when you're doing it at the second level, so to speak, you're using it just for a specific data view, and it's not changing the default friendly name. It's just for that particular data view. So um, let me uh, let me let me do this. I'm going to hit escape and go to uh, here and make sure this is. Right database. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's go back here for a second. 
And I'm going to get an accession data view. Okay. So the other day, what I had done is I had added a, added a field, and the field's map name was URL. And it was really all I had done was created a text field with the idea that I could put a URL address in here. But then later, I came and made another data view using the same uh, table. And over here, when I use that field, where is I went too fast, it's up front. I did that in the data view editor. All right, so if I were to look at this in the data view editor, so let's go back to here, wherever that may be. So I had the accession data view, but the other day I created this data view. Again, I was using the same table, which was accession. But for some reason, I wanted to rearrange the columns or maybe I could even take out columns. You know, sometimes the user would maybe want to use the accession data view from one perspective and then use a different one to do different work. But in this case, when I added that field, where is it? I put it up at the top. I went over to here, and that's how I got that name. So what uh, the point I'm just making is that there's two levels of friendly names. One is done when you map the table, and you do that in table mapping, and that's the default friendly name. So in the first example with accession, the friendly name by default was URL. <clears throat> but here I created another data view and for whatever reason, I wanted to have a different friendly name. <clears throat> we do that uh, infrequently and you can see this. If I look at this uh, database, I've already opened up two data views and these are explained in the PowerPoints. But um, let's go to here. I'm looking at the uh, data view called sys data view field lang. And it's currently in the different languages, but for the English, for that new data view, it added an entry in this table. And altogether, there's only 147 entries in this table. That, in other words, in the entire database of over a thousand fields, only 147 have uh, modified friendly names. And if I switch and went just to English, in this database, there are only eight. So for whatever reason, and this is primarily used for demonstration purposes. But I know, for example, the USDA, they call geography at some place geography. And I, um, I forget what they call it, but then in another place, uh, they call it origin or something like that. And you can look that up by looking at your tables and um, going into this data view, so this data view field line. Let me go back to this. All right. And this field, this table, table field lang is giving you the default names. Okay. So in my example, make it larger. When I mapped the new field that I created, uh, URL, I actually, in the database, it was called note URL. And um, in the default 
so to speak, uh, table accession, when you go look at it in the data view, the heading is URL, and we've talked about it. So I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but I just, it's an important concept. I'm hoping that these uh, slides will make you aware of this, because every once in a while, the users are gonna say, we don't think of this field with that name. We think of it by this name. Well, change the name. Just simply change the name in the data view, and then everybody's happy. But you didn't even have to change the database. The database still has the original table field name. And I raise this question, and you all should be able to answer this. What's the easiest way or an easier way to the default to determine the default friendly names? How would you do that? I gave you that answer uh, really in this lesson. And we could wait or we could cheat and go forward. So I think we'll go for it. Anytime you want to know a default friendly name, go into table mapping. All right. And that's where you will get it. So just kind of remember that. And the reason I point that out is because the data view editor does not distinguish between the default friendly name and a friendly name that you made for that particular data view. To me, that's one of the weaknesses of the data view editor. I wish there were some indicator to indicate that that was an overriding and not the original friendly name. In order to find original friendly names, go to table mappings. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. Now, do you have to do this making friendly names one at a time? Not really. It's, it's a, as I just showed you, those tables can be seen within the curator tool. And I just put some directions here. Uh, first of all, you would sign one as the administrator, so you just wouldn't have anybody do this. Um, uh, it's interesting, in the USDA, for whatever reason, I volunteered to create the friendly names. And so that's one of the little tasks that I do. And um, they've given me privileges with one of my uh, email accounts that I could sign one and have administrator privileges just to update those two fields. There's, I'm sorry, there's two tables. So now, I'm going to segue into talking about codes and code groups. And this is an important concept for every organization because you get thousands of codes when you download Green Global, and you probably don't want to use all those codes. The other reason why it's pertinent for today's discussion is because when you're working with the codes, you work with the code value, but you also have to work with the code title and the code description. So I'm gonna show you how all of this ties together. We're gonna to talk about codes, about languages, about the curator tool, and about the admin tool. And all of these things are kind of interwoven. And in the process, it's gonna introduce us to the import wizard. So what are codes? All right, you all should know this, right? When a user's in the curator tool, and I'm, I'm showing you right now the accession data view, and I have it in two parts, and so why? Um, we know that in the accession data view, anytime you see a field like this with the, in these case, they're empty, and it has null in brackets, if you are a user and you click in edit mode, it pops up and gives you a drop down. It looks like this. So in this case, if the user had clicked on uh, the status, notice what I did, by the way, I intentionally misspelled status. So there's an example where I, I messed up uh, overriding friendly names. So I can fix that by going into the data view editor. And I meant to change it, I apparently forgot. Um, but anyway, uh, down here, there's the drop down for status. So there's three codes, 
for this group. Okay. And let's do another thing. Let's go live for a second. And let me go to the accession data view. Right. You all know, um, if I scroll to the right, I can move my mouse up to there and it tells me the title, which are, are the actual database table field name, status code. And then the last part of that, I included the description and in the description, it gives you the name of the, the, the status. It gives you the name of the code group that's used. In this case, it says accession status code group. Unfortunately, you have to keep doing that to read the whole thing. Now, I can't see this unless I really go into edit mode. And you can widen the column to make sure it's wide enough. And there are currently three status codes in this particular database for the accession status, active, inactive, and security backup. Uh, as a side note, um, it's kind of interesting. The USDA, uh, they've been using GRIN for 30 years and GRIN Global for five. They're still making changes all the time. And so in our next release, they're only going to use two statuses. It's either active or inactive. And there's kind of a funny story behind this, but the original GRIN only had one status, which was inactive, because the assumption was if something wasn't inactive, it was active. Um, I kind of argued that users wanted to see the word active, and so they begrudgingly created that extra uh, code. And over time, they added a couple more, but now they're going back and just going to have active and inactive. But that doesn't mean that your database, your database, your organization could have different statuses for whatever reason. I know that some gene banks have a status they call temp. So that means they had to, they had to add that status into this code group. And what I'm going to show you next is how you would do that. And I'm going to show you several different ways that you could do that. Um, I'll stop just for a second. Does anybody need to ask me anything at this point about this? Does this make sense? Maybe you can write it in chat. Well, let's go on. Okay. I thought this was an interesting question. In fact, it was kind of related to a question somebody asked me in an email in the last week or two. Um, did you notice, I should have kept this lower like this, but um, why is it, let's say if I started, let's pretend I was going to create, I'm still in edit mode, and I go to create a new record. Look what happened. That's pretty cool. This, this code had the default value of active. I don't know if you've ever lost sleep over this at night trying to figure out, well, how did they do that? Because the other ones do not have defaults. So here's how they did that. Or here's how you do that. Okay. You actually have a, fee, a, a table called sys table field, and it has a place for the default values. And you wouldn't believe this, but guess what the field name is called? Default value. Okay. And um, here's some code. I'm going to give you a homework assignment tonight that basically says run all the SQL or some of the SQL that I've got here in this PowerPoint. And um, if you copy this SQL, you could see in your database what are the default values for the codes that the CT would see. 
Okay. So um, one of the ways that you evaluate the codes and code groups is with the admin tool. So that's what I'm going to do next. And these two slides are just a reminder to me. Let's go live and I'm going to look at, I'll use the same example. Uh, no, I'll use accession status. So let's go to the admin tool. So I think we briefly had looked at this and I said we would be covering this. Well, today's the time to cover this. So it's kind of hidden. I don't know why, but for one reason or another, you got to do that. So under maintenance, you open up maintenance and then uh, go to code groups. So what are we looking at? I'm in the AT. I'm looking at my local host. I'm doing this because I don't want to mess up the community database. All right. And um, there's quite a few of these code groups. In fact, if you look in the lower left corner, there are 119. Now, a lot of those are not common to most people. Um, if you look at these NC7s, NC7 is the code name. This, I shouldn't use the word code. It's the site abbreviation for Ames, Iowa. So a lot of these are not pertinent to the rest of the world. And this would be a good example for me to say, get rid of them. Okay. If they came in the database, uh, you don't really need them. But there are at least 50 code groups. So I would go out and look at accession status as our example. So I highlight it, and this is pretty cool because there's a lot of information here, okay? There's the name of the group, accession status. We just consistently used uppercase. It was a default from Grin, and they carried it over to Grin Global. The, the, the case doesn't really matter. This column tells me how many places tables or data views actually refer to accession status. And then this column says how many values, in other words, how many records, how many codes are there for accession status. So there are three codes as we saw, and this is telling me all the places. So let's go to double click. And there are the three values. We saw those here, the titles in the curator tools showed up as active, inactive, or security backup. And here are the descriptions. Now, the actual value is this column. That's really the actual code value. And notice they're all in uppercase. Again, this was a convention that came from Grin, and they just kept it when they transferred to Grin Global. Well, I kind of like it in the sense that the code is distinct in that it's uppercase and the title we use the mix case. I'm going to talk more about this a little bit. This tab is telling us every place that this is being used. So it's being used by the accession table, and these are all the different data views currently using this code group. Not to say over time it might be used somewhere else. Okay. What happens more often than not is they may decide that a code group should be spawned off to another code group because they want to use a subset for a particular need. And so they will clone it and then reduce the extra codes, give it a different name, and then that code group is used differently. So an example might be uh, something in the public website might need a subset of a code group. So they'll create a separate one just for the website. In fact, let's see, are there any called? Yeah, so here's a good example of that. In the website, here's some that are specific for that. Okay. I would recommend spending some time here and playing with these. All right, here's one that's absolutely fascinating. Three hundred seventy eight values.
you may not want all of these. So you might decide that you're never going to use some of these. And so I would recommend, in fact, there is a document, and I need to update this document some more. I'm going to show you this document. Some of you I know have seen this, but just in case you haven't, under documentation, under administer, uh, administrator documents, the very first one I have here, procedures for preparing the organization's installation. That document talks about some of the things I'm talking about here about uh, reviewing the code groups and removing codes that your group is never going to use. And, and this is, uh, I try to put this together as kind of a cookbook, if you will. I've got another cookbook we're going to talk about, but um, it, uh, it at least is a helpful start. All right, let's go on with this. All right. The other thing is the language. Let's go look at that. So if I go back to here, it's kind of subtle, but there's the codes. When we look at them in English, the value is here, the title is here, the description. Now, let me go back to this, um, the one that we were working with, accession status. Less the distract. Okay. Now, remember I said earlier that there are two languages at a minimum you should keep running in Green Global. One is English. Most, unfortunately or fortunately, most people are using English as their base language. Okay. But also, the second one you should use is ENG. And it's interesting, in ENG, this is not a really good example, but um, they've actually made the title similar to the values. Um, I'll, I'm going to demonstrate this in another way in a little bit. But anyway, at least you can see what the titles are. And I haven't really explained how you use ENG yet, so we're going to get into that shortly. Now, um, I put some numbers here just to point out some things. When I'm looking at that screen in the AT, this is the group name. So the group name is here and here. This is the actual code name. This is the title of the code. This is the description of the code. I wish this said code value because that's what it is. It's the code. Now, um, here's a better example of the difference between English and ENG. Uh, accession name type, we've got a bunch of these in English. They're quite lengthy. But in ING, the values are much shorter. They're, they're almost like, a, not abbreviations, but there's a lot of text here. Now, I'll show you why that's useful. Um, this picture I'm showing you, I'm in the curator tool. Pretend that the user is editing, okay? And they click in the drop down. In the English language, the category, in this case, it's the accession inventory name uh, record. The category, is all of these okay i'm in english but look what the in eng it shows up i'm in the same data view but now i'm in a different language and now the categories are simpler all right why is this such a big deal if you were doing a drag and drop from an excel spreadsheet it would be a lot easier to use the codes rather than the titles. Okay. Um, one of our users, bless his heart, years ago, he's a very savvy user, but he has a problem with typing. And so he really asked for this. He said, in the old grin, I could use the codes and not the titles. 
And that's exactly what ENG is doing. ENG is allow, allowing you to use the codes instead of the titles, but you need to switch back and forth. And there's a whole document on this, and that's why I put that link here. I don't know how many of you have used this feature, but it really does make it a lot easier if you're doing bulk mass drag and drops from Excel into Green Global, especially when you're setting it up for the first time. Use the ENG, populate, and then flip to the other language. So that's all I'm going to say about that for now, but feel free to read this document and ask any questions about it. Um, I could spend a half an hour going through a demonstration. One of the things that you're going to find out is, and you're switching back and forth, you have to update the lookup tables. And depending on your uh, network and so on, that might take a few minutes. The local host here, I don't have a lot of data. It's fairly quickly, but it's really a minor topic. So for today, I just, I've got these slides. Um, we talked about it, and I'd like you to read this document right before you want to go to bed. Uh, but it will explain what I'm talking about. And again, ask questions and emails. Now, the, today, what one of the big things we were talking about was using the import wizard. And so I'm going to give you the pros and cons of using the import wizard. And then I'm going to start by using the example of the code groups that we just looked at. And again, this is where it all ties together because we're also talking about using different languages when we import using import wizard. Okay. So I'm going to um, mention there's the same numbers I was using earlier. When I'm in the import wizard, I'm going to see a screen that looks like this. And this is the group name. And it says that this is the actual code value. This is the title and this is the description. I'm going to explain the screen in much more depth in a minute. Um, let me see. There was something else I thought about that I was going to say. Well, the first thing I want to get across all right, is this. There is a document online. I call it the Import Wizard Cookbook. It's a guide. And uh, it says the revision date. I took this, I went in there the other day, looked at it. I haven't changed that guide in five years, five and a half years. When I wrote it, it was in 2010. And the reason I called it a cookbook at that time, because it was almost a joke. It was only meant, original idea for the import wizard was almost like a spur of the moment design. Um, we were running a class in April of 2010, and we had people from all over the world in Beltsville, Maryland, and the software was really raw. It was really rough. And every day they were doing a new build and expecting the participants to enter their data over and over and over again. And I said, wait a minute, guys, this is crazy. They've already done this. By Wednesday, they've done the same thing three times. I said, we need a way to import data quickly. And the programmer, his name is Brock Weaver, came back the next day with the import wizard. So this import wizard did not have a lot of, uh, what he did was, I mean, it's fantastic what he did. And a lot of you have used it, I know, and love it. But I really do have this caveat. It was, it's not perfect for all the data that you need to get into your system. And um, it never, ever was used in a production mode at the USDA. So they had the luxury of time. They took their data and wrote SQL scripts to import all of their existing data from GRIN to GRIN Global. But the rest of the world is not coming from GRIN. They're coming from your own database. So that's why a lot of people like the import wizard. I understand that. But again, the caveat is, it really hasn't kept up with the data views. Um, and it has had some changes, but there were real minor tweaks to some of the data views. Because if you look in the data view editor, the import wizard uses its own data views. So 
Um, I did see value, though, in the import wizard in a couple of different ways, and I'd like to talk about that's my focus here. So even though it's called the import wizard, it does more than import. It's really good for displaying existing records. And um, it's also good for getting data uh, into a spreadsheet quickly, okay? Um, it can sort data. Let me let me come back to this. So let, let me use this as an example. I'm going to go live and go to the import wizard. And I don't have Excel open, so I'm going to open Excel. I'll just take a blank spreadsheet. All righty. So let's go to here and close that. And I'm going to the import. Wizard. I'm going to stop at some point and ask for some people who have used the import wizard for their comments, but I'll, I'll wait a few minutes and let me just walk through the basics first, because some of you all have used the import wizard much more than I have in real production situations. But again, the caveat, uh, it's almost like uh, buyer beware. Uh, you have to be real careful, but it does have its value. So here's an example. So this is the interface. And you better make sure that your database name is up there. If it's not, you have a problem. And it may happen to me while I'm here. What I will frequently do is just close the admin tool and then reopen it. Okay. But in any case, I don't know why I'm losing my link every once in a while. So it says you can import, but I'm not going to import it right now. I'm going to basically draw out the data. So I'm going to go and there's a list of data views. And it's interesting, again, because I requested this to put these numerically like this so that people knew the order to follow when they were importing. This was the recommended order. If you read my cookbook, it says put in name groups, put in code groups, and I describe each one of these in depth in that cookbook. But I'm going to not right now use it for importing. I want to see what's in the system. All right, and there's a little box here. I love it. I want it in English, but I have the other languages. And I'm looking at this. It doesn't matter right now, I'm not creating, I'm just gonna view. But in any case, that's the default, okay? I'm going to, and these are other users with administrative privileges on this database. But typically you're gonna use administrator. So I'm going to go next, and because I picked the code groups, here are the code groups and codes in the system, in the database. So there's the group name. I'll widen this. Here is the actual code value. Here are the titles for the codes, and you notice a lot of them don't have descriptions, and that's typical. There's no real place too much where a description comes into play. They thought they were going to do different things, but nobody ever got around to it. So um, if I want to export this to a spreadsheet, first of all, look what I've got. We've got 20, um, almost 2,400 rows down here. It tells you how many. And again, I'm in the English. I only wanted English when I asked for this. So I'll select all up in the top corner, and then I'll just drag and drop. So now I have all of my code groups and all of my codes in a spreadsheet, and it makes it easy to re review and manipulate. And I could have sorted these first, but I kind of also can sort it in Excel, okay? Now, some of them did have descriptions. And of course, in Excel, I would freeze that top row just to make it easier to look. All right. Now, 
this is a little side note. I'm going to use a different tab here. If I want, what I got here were the friendly names. But if I go over to here, I select it all by hitting that top left corner. And now I'm going to hold down the control key and drag and drop. So that's the actual name of the field in the database. It's called group name. You know, there's a table and the, these records are in there. These are just records in the table, but they're special because they decided that people would use these in drop downs. And so instead of using lookups to find this data, um, we put these in these groups and then in the curator tool, wherever you want to use a drop down, you access a group. Okay. Let me go back. Okay. So, um, what else? Let's, where am I here? All right. Yeah. So you can sort out colors and drag and drop. We did that. And then finally I'll show you this. So let me, um, show you these other things in this slide. Yeah, I've been getting this. I don't know why. The, I just recently reinstalled everything and I'm not sure if I'm not quite. So I, what I'm going to do is close and reopen. The, admin tool. Again, I think what it does is just temporarily SQL Express, it's mess, messing up or something. So I'm not sure though. Anyway, this is where we were. We were viewing the data. All right. Um, something to point out that you probably noticed, the headings at the top are different colors. There's a meaning to those colors. What that's telling me in this case, there's two different colors. That means this data is coming from two different tables in the database. And if you don't know which table, just click in a cell. So when I click in this column down here, it tells me it's coming from the code value table, CD. If I click over here, it's coming from the code value language table. So this is one of those cases where there are two interrelated tables, code value and code value lang. And it's kind of, in a way, you can do it. You, we know we can manually add codes through the code group tool in the admin tool. But if you're adding a lot of codes and a lot of groups, then this is the way to do it because it's basically updating two different tables at the same time. And as you know, the curator tool doesn't do that. Typically in the curator tool, when you open up a data view, it's, it's sometimes using data from multiple tables, but it only updates one main primary table. And that's the beauty of the import wizard. The import wizard can open multiple tables and the joins behind the scenes are allowing you as a user here as the administrator to update multiple tables simultaneously with one tool. So in this case, if you update codes and code groups, you're actually dumping data into two different tables. Let's see, I wanted to demonstrate, uh, what was I gonna show? Well, let's take a look at accessions. I think that's what I'll do next, let's see. Yeah, let's go look at the curator tool. I'm gonna to go, I thought I had the search tool. Okay, let's open the search tool and I'm still here in it. Now it opened for me. Okay, I just wanna show you how many um, accessions I have in this database. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do a magic trick and I, I know I'm giving you the background. So 
if I click here and put in an asterisk, that gives me everything. If I change this, it's got 10,000 for the limit. There's only one exception in this database. Okay. So our users already created their accessions in Excel. I want to get that easily into the uh, green level database. I could do it two ways. I could go through using the curator tool, which I feel very comfortable doing, but you could also use the admin tool. But again, the caveat is I would not do this in a production basis on a day to day basis. Once you've initially installed data into the system, you should not be really probably using the admin tool, the, um, the import wizard, except for maybe the code groups, but, um, and maybe a couple others, but let's go ahead and just demonstrate how this actually works to import. So I'm going to go and show you how I can dump a lot of records quickly. So let me go back and I'm going to pick exceptions. So I've got to jump in through. I'm not doing a lot of these in the order. <clears throat> but if I viewed existing data, I could have gotten the same result. There's just that one record. All right. Now it says load from file. So I've actually got a CSV file or a text file. And it knew from the last time I used this where to go look. So I have a data view. I'm sorry. I have a file, a spreadsheet. Let me open this up. And I name these to um, match the import wizard. So I actually created a file of accessions. And we could open that in Excel and see all these different accessions. But I'm going to do it here. And what it just did, it brought in two, it says 2,772 rows, and then it's starting to flag some errors. The trouble is it doesn't find all the errors at one time, as we'll see shortly. But in this case, if I go over to the red eye, it says it's not a, a correct value. So I probably, since these were all wild material, I'm gonna make the assumption I wanted that as well. But I'd probably, in reality, go back, look at my spreadsheet and try to figure out, okay? This is kind of cool because it shows you what the value, values can be when you scroll over. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I intentionally have a file here that knows got some problems with it. So at this point, I already did that step. I loaded from the file. So um, I'm going to go ahead and import. Also, by the way, down here, if you have multiple errors, we'll see this next. I only have one. So I don't have to jump to the next error. I fixed that one, I think. So let me click over there. It went away. I haven't clicked yet. So now I'm going to import. Ah, lots of errors. Okay. And look at that. When I did this import, I have over 2,700 errors, which means I'd be here all day fixing these. Okay. Because consistently, they're all in the same place. If I go anywhere else, there aren't any other errors. And what it's telling me is I didn't have a valid accession status code. As we know earlier, we said there were three valid codes and apparently I forgot that column. So let me just completely cancel this. That would be the easiest way. And what I'm going to do now is go look at the spreadsheets. So let me go back here to my source spreadsheet. That's not it.
that's not it. Where is it? Sorry. Data files. If I read, I just saw it. Shoot. There it is. I had it down one extra level. So here are all these CSV files. The one I just imported was this one. And let me open this. And I was missing a status column. There's no status column. If I go back to here, when I discovered this, I kept my original file, but I made a duplicate. And what I did was I added column G. And I made them all active because that's what they're going to be. They're going to be active accessions. So now, rather than fool around with the import wizard and make all those corrections there, I was able to do it here in Excel. It took me all two minutes. And now I'm going to import this file. Okay. Now, this is kind of interesting. Watch what happens. Remember, this file is open. So watch this. And I'll go that extra step. Don't have to, but there's proof. I still only have that one record. So now I'm going to load from file, but I'm going to pick my new file. And my new file is this guy. And when I go to open it, I get a warning. It says it's already opened, not a big deal. So what I need to do is say, okay, close the spreadsheet. I didn't make any changes. And while I'm at it, I'll close this other one. Well, that's not the one I'm using, so it doesn't matter. Now I'll go back to here. Now I'll load the file. And there's the one that I corrected and added the extra column. I still got that first error, which I could have fixed. Again, if I click somewhere else, that error will take. Okay. And now let's try the import. Takes a little while. And when Carlos gave me a story that uh, I don't know if it's their wheat or their maize, but it took them two days. While we're waiting, Juan Carlos, do you have anything to add here or you seen? Because I know you two, if you seen is here, <coughs> have used this quite a bit. The only thing that I can say, Marty, is that the, the import wizard, uh, why using the, the import wizard uh, in order to add the code values and groups and that kind of information? Yes, it's an excellent tool and it saves you a lot of time that way. Yeah. I agree. But uh, especially if you're setting up a grid global for testing purposes, go for it. Now, in this case, I still have a ton of errors, but it imported quite a few. And if I wanted to, there's just way too many, and I'm not going to take the time today, obviously. But you can actually go back to here and try to fix the errors. So if I had a really low number, I would probably do that. But if I just continue on by and this telling me that it worked, so these updates and inserts, means that it updated it it inserted records <clears throat> so record number two was in and so on and i've added quite a few i think i'm good to go and 
and I'll exit. And I, got, I had looked at that problem because when I was setting this demo up, the problem was that it uh, there were some taxonomy issues. So uh, I wanted to go to the curator tool or a search tool. Let's do this again. I just dumped 2,300 records accessions using that import wizard. Okay. So, uh, back to our storyline. Okay. It's a pretty cool tool. And as Juan Carlos said, it's excellent for modifying codes and code groups. All right. And we demonstrated this. It's also, I would say, very good at viewing other tables. So as an administrator, you don't even have to launch the curator tool. Just go in there and pull up. Let's let's do another example. Let's do this one. View and taxonomy species. There are a lot of taxonomy species records in this database. Because remember, when you install Grid Global, you can, as an option, include taxonomy, which is a good idea. I should have picked uh, family or ge genus. I thought I did this quicker last time I did this. There it goes. Anyway, look what I've got. I've got over 120,000 records, and um, it's showing me the family. And it, remember, you can click, and it tells you the name of the table. So these dark grays are from the family. Here's the genus. And here's species information. And in the species, you've got things like varieties and all that good stuff. So pretty cool tool for viewing data. I would say go for it. But for importing data, only for test purposes in the beginning, um, it doesn't do a good job at deleting records. All right. It, the whole idea was to do a quick data dump. And, um, you know, once you have production data, uh, I don't think you want to take chances of messing things up. But like Juan Carlos said, you could use the code groups and it's, uh, you know, you can always have a backup and you've, you can tell right away if everything's good. And it's not a big deal because it's a pretty simple, uh, data view that's being involved it's using two tables but it does save time so i think that's all i wanted to say today about import wizard all right now oh, data views have changed but the import wizard is not so that's where it comes into problems sometimes and you can either import or drag and drop all right and then we saw the results the other thing to remember is typically it's done by the administrator. So the records, when they're dumped in there, are owned by the administrator. So in the case of accessions, then as an administrator, you would probably want to give ownership to a curator. And we're going to talk about ownership in lesson five and permissions. So just as an FYI. So the last topic, we have a few minutes left, is to talk about searches. Um, we've got about 15 minutes. Um, let me just take a quick check. Before I go on, does anybody have any questions about anything I've covered today? Um, must codes be mutually exclusive? Um, <laughs> Do you mean uh, by mutually exclusive? In each group, 
each code is this thing. Could you use two code groups with similar codes or the same codes? Can you hear me, Marty? Yes, yes, okay, yes. So, so for something like accession status, clearly yes. an accession should only be active or inactive. Um, but for something like there was a code which was to do with whether it had, had a pathology test, yes. an accession might have had multiple tests for multiple different pathologies. So I was just trying to work out whether, yeah, whether they would always have to be mutually exclusive. Um, okay, so I think that goes back to the the way the the table is set up. So um, in pathology. If that's being used on an inventory lot, it's just going to have one uh, occurrence of that value. Does that make sense? Uh, in other words, you could not put more in one field. Is that like, yeah, you could have, yeah, you, no, that's everything in Green Global is pretty much one item in a field. Uh, and then when you have multiple of anything, that means you immediately are going to need multiple rows. Yes. And, okay. And that's great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's try to go ahead with this. And if we don't quite finish it today, I think we can, but we can pick it up again on uh, next Tuesday. So next week, as a reminder, it's Tuesday and Thursday. But anyway. So this last section is on searches and I put this in here because I felt as an administrator, this is good background information and it's in different places, but I thought it would be helpful to have it in this class. Okay. So the first question I raise is do the searches in the PW work exactly as those in the CT? Do you, this is a trick question. Um, would you say yes or would you say no? because I'm telling you it's a trick question. <laughs> uh, the answer is it's sort of, all right. In other words, when you're in a, this left top left screen is from the public website and the new public website. And when you're searching in there, you're using the search engine. When you're in the curator tool or the search tool, you're using the search engine there. So the, the, they're, they're using the same engine to do the searches. Where the trick question comes into play is on top of the search engine, there's a little bit of code sometimes in the public website. And so the public website page, whatever page that might be, might, they, might be saying, go out and do the search. But because they're in such and such screen, just bring up the active accessions or whatever. So there are some filtering. Uh, we ran into this when I was working with Norgen last year. They had set up some different status codes and then their accessions weren't showing up in the public website. And we figured it out. It was funny, it was like the light bulb went on. They, they realized right away what happened was the status codes. Apparently the public website was really looking for active at that point. And, and so it didn't see their accessions. Now, this is an interesting thing. And I brought this example out for a good purpose. You know, the question I have raised here is, and I know we're not gonna get finished today, so we'll repeat some of this on uh, Tuesday. What does a search engine search? Well, the um, three different categories of stuff. The first thing is whatever you tell it to search. And this is an example. I'm going to highlight this. This is text. Okay. This is, you know, something that you're used to seeing when you're in the curator tool. I don't know if you guys are aware of this. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to go to here. This is the USDA's public website and I'm currently logged in. So because I'm logged in, it doesn't matter, but 
I'm going to go here to accessions and go to the advanced search and drop that code in here. And that code was saying, give me accessions who are at higher than 100 meters or something like that at a certain latitude. Uh, I didn't like that. <laughs> uh, worked before for me. Well, let me just go back and I'm not gonna take the time. I don't know why it's not working right now. Um, the point I'm making is this, you as an internal user know that you can use the search tool to generate code that looks like that. Your external users using the public website do not know these fields and table names. You know, that was the table and that's the field name. And then this is the criteria. And the point I'm saying is here that sometimes your users out in the public want to find something in the database, but they don't have the tools to do that. You can send them this text and say, here, drop this into the public website and they will, it, it will work just like it does in this search tool. Okay. That's all I'm saying. The other thing, and this is kind of strange, the way they've written the search engine and the guy, Kurt Enders, some of you know Kurt, um, he's been in there uh, over the years making some nice fine tunes to the search engine. So he indicated that when you're doing list search, it's actually looking for patterns. If it sees four blocks of text, it's assuming it's an inventory identifier, because as you know, it's the inventory prefix, number, suffix, and type, four different fields that compose the inventory identifier. So the search engine assumes if you put in the list search for fields, you must be giving it an inventory. If you give it three blocks of text, it's assuming it's an accession. If you give it one block of text, it will look up accessions as well. And he did that <laughs> because he noticed that some gene banks only use the prefix field and they put all of their accession identifier in that one field. And finally, this is kind of interesting that you can put in an order number. Shoot, I wrote an order number down. Okay. Um, if you put that order number in, in a list search, it actually gives you accessions. Um, not many people would know this, but it, it's good for you to know. Let's go back to here. All right, let's try this. Um, I'm going to go to there, the list search, and I'm going to put in an order number. I tested and found an order in their production system. And this is kind of interesting. What it's given to me is the accessions that were in that order. So if you're working, you can use this as a tool or your curators, if they have an order number, want to see what was requested, they can just pop that into the list search, the actual order number. I'm not talking about the web order number, but the order number. And that will give you the list of accessions that were in that, that was in that order. And then finally, uh, there's the search engine also does free form searches. It looks for accession IDs, inventory IDs, and this is the reason why I'm bringing this up. It now has the capability of you as a use as a, an administrator of indicating which fields in the database to search. And those fields are decided by you as the administrator. And those fields are kept in one table called the SysSearch auto field table. And in my case right now, I've got 30 fields. Um, there is the code that will tell you what fields are included. Okay. And we're running out of time. So this is going to be your homework. You're going to run this code on your database and you can either do this either in SQL server management studio, or you could do it on your public website, assuming that you're logged in and under tools query, run this query, and that will give back to you the names of the search fields 
currently set up in the database. So I'm telling you here what I just said. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, this slide is saying how you add fields. So if you're a SQL Server person, um, you could just use a SQL insert statement. Or in the Management Studio, you can determine the primary key for the field you intend to use and then update it that way. And I've got some examples. And again, because of the time, I don't want to rush this too much. So I'm just going to show you these slides um, and then we'll, we'll pick up these quickly the next time. But if you review these slides, it'll make sense. So I'm looking in the table called the sys table field. Suppose I had a field that I wanted to be searchable called web availability note. And this field, wherever that is, I believe it's in the inventory table, okay? So I actually went and found this field by looking for it in this table. And when I found it, I found out that it's sys table field ID was 2810. Now, what I'm doing here, I'm adding a row and I'm using SQL Server Management Studio is the easiest way. And I'm adding a row to this table and there's the same ID. I'm sorry, the table is sys search auto field table. I should have had this folded. And I'm updating and putting that 2810. So I determined that by looking in this table and now I'm adding a row. And so what that's doing is adding another search field for the search engine to look at when you're doing searches. So you can actually configure. When Green Global was first started at the USDA, they had 33 fields, I think, or 31 fields that they were searching. So when somebody typed something in one of those search boxes, either in the search tool or on the public website, it automatically went out to 31 different fields. However, now we're doing something else at the USDA and that introduces us to the other thing the search engine uses. It also uses the capability that's in uh, SQL Server of using full text indexes. And I'm not teaching SQL Server, but the table where these indexes are in is in the sys full text index table. And this will tell you if it's turned on or not for your database. And here is the SQL that will let you know what fields are indexed. So we'll pick up again on this the next uh, session just briefly. But the point I'm making here is that the, um, let's see if I have another slide. No, I'm gonna go back to here. Is the point I'm making today is the search engine really searches a couple different ways. It searches when you actually give it some structured, this is not SQL, but it's, you know, a string that's used by the search engine to create a SQL search. It's also specific things when you're doing a list search. And then it has this free form. And in that case, it's doing it by either IDs, fields in the search auto field table, or fields that have been indexed in a full text index. So it's a lot to uh, take in at once. Uh, what I'd ask you to do is to read these slides, run those uh, SQLs, those queries in your system, and then send me questions or ask on the next session. So at this point, uh, Juan Carlos, it's almost nine o'clock here. I have to get my second cup of coffee or I'm get a headache. Uh, what do you want to say, anything? And just remind him I'm sure about Tuesday. Okay, no, Mati, Oli, uh, please, uh, I send the invitation for the next session last Wednesday. If some of you didn't receive this invitation, please uh, send me an email in order to send to you again the invitations. That's all for the moment. 
Okay. And we'll um, put today's uh, PowerPoint. Um, at, uh, there's going to be a homework assignment, and uh, and I'll put the when we've recorded this. Uh, Juan Carlos, I guess you could stop the recording, and then we'll put that up there as well, the link to that. Okay. And, 